Amen. Praise the Lord for that. I'm so thankful for the everlasting life that is given to us as the children of God and the great grace that God gives to us. What a blessing. Amen. I wanted to invite you to take the Word of God with me this evening, and we'll begin by turning to the book of Psalms. You'll find that right in the middle of your Bible, Psalm chapter number 42, and we'll look at the whole of the psalm this evening as we embrace the Word of God together tonight. All right. How many of you got a Sunday afternoon nap in today? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you? Okay, good, good, good. Um, For those of you who did not, I have bad news for you tonight. I got mine, so I am ready to go. (laughs) So if you were hoping to get one in this evening, um, I wouldn't hold your breath, okay, because I'm excited. (laughs) The Word of God is here before us, and I love Psalm 42. I've certainly preached from it many times, and each and every time I've read it and, and preached from it, it's been such an encouragement and a blessing to me. And certainly as we read the Word of God, it's interesting sometimes to see how the different sections of Scripture communicate different truths and how the Word of God fits together in such a beautiful way. There's a couple of connections here. We do find that this psalm is given a title here. It says, to the chief musician, Maskil, for the sons of Korah. Now, we don't really know the human penman for sure on this psalm. Uh, At least 75 of the psalms have been attributed to David. And so most of them we know were written, or half of them we know were written by David. So it's a significant amount. But this one we don't have a title on. Interestingly, what we find is there's a repetition in this psalm. Verse 5 and verse 11 are basically identical. And then the next psalm, verse 5, is again a repetition. And so whoever wrote Psalm 42 may also have written Psalm 43. But again, we don't have a name attached to that one. So we'll see how, we, uh, see how God can work through that. And I'm thankful sometimes that we don't have a name attached to certain things because sometimes that helps us think, maybe that's for me too. <laughs> it's not just for one person, but uh, one person's story and one person's situation. But God can apply it to each of our hearts. All right, if you found that text, I'll invite you to stand with me if you're able, and we'll read from Psalm 42, and I'll go right through verse 1 to verse 11. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I, pour, or when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I wanted to draw your attention to this portion of Scripture this evening. The title of the message is Divine Desperation. Let's pray. Lord God, as we open your word again this evening, Lord, I acknowledge to you tonight that there's nothing that I can do or say this evening without your help and strength. And Lord, I pray that as you work through this message this evening, that your word would shine, that you would receive all the glory, and that our hearts would be drawn into your purpose and direction for us as we seek after you, as we seek to lead a life of urgency, of passion, and of desperation before you, that we'd hunger after you with all of our hearts. So we pray your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. you may be seated. Here in the text of Scripture, I love the way that God communicates to us in ways that are so human and relevant, and yet the illustrations that he uses sometimes are so um, vivid and so real and so relatable. And so what we find here is in the beginning of the psalm, we have this idea of a deer. The old word there is a heart. It refers to a male deer or a a buck or a stag. And uh, so he's running, he is panting, he is thirsty, and he is what we would say desperate. And so the first point of the message this evening is the pursued, because the inference here is that this deer is not 
in a situation of casual interest in something. This is a situation of urgency, of longing, of need. The idea here is of one that's been pursued by a hunter, that's been chased. Uh, whenever you see deer out in the wild, usually they're not moving very quickly unless they have a reason to, okay? They don't, they're not crazy like humans and run just for the fun of it, okay? They run when they need to, okay? And so this deer that has been so, um, reached such a state of fervency and exhaustion and desperate need of a drink, uh, it's not because he decided to go out and run a marathon just because he had nothing else to do, no, but because of an urgent need, a desperate situation. Deer usually only run when they sense danger. And so this deer is pictured here as one who has been pursued, one who has been wearied to exhaustion, to desperate need. I think that we all understand the experience of thirst. <laughs> Sometimes those hot summer days, maybe you're out working or exercising or doing something and it's hot, maybe the sun's beating down upon you and you feel so desperately thirsty, you'd give just about anything for a glass of cold water. The Word of God gives us such encouragement that God provides for our needs, and yet sometimes, spiritually, we can get that desperation and that urgency as well. And certainly, as we look at the psalmist here, he's using this picture to picture himself. He's talking about this heart who's panting after the water brooks, and certainly there's a song many of you would be familiar with about that, and uh, I like that song quite a bit. But here he's picturing himself as this deer that is desperate, this deer that is urgent, and passionately yearning for refreshment, for help, for rescue. Here the psalmist faced some opposition. He faced some persecution. He faced attack. We find in verses 9 and 10 that he was attacked by people. In verse 9, he says, I will say unto my God, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So we think of the psalmist as one who was under the oppression of enemies. Now, this was not neighbors and acquaintances who mildly disliked him. We don't use the word oppression and enemy for a slightly inconvenient person who disagrees with us about politics. This is something much more extreme. He had somebody who literally hated him, somebody who was an enemy and was actively trying to oppress him, to push him down, to... Um, uh, abuse him, to hurt him, to uh, hinder his life. So we see oppression there in verse 9. In verse 10, as with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? And so these people, well, they mocked him, they laughed at him, they insulted him, they hated him. Their words were like a sword in his bones. <laughs> this guy never heard sticks and stones <laughs> may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. <laughs> the psalmist had never heard that one. And I, I think he's, he's right. Their words were like a sword in his bones. So he was facing oppression. He was facing reproach and insult. So people were mocking him and saying, yeah, where's your God? Your life is terrible. If your God was real, he would help you. If your God was real, he would rescue you. If your God was real, he would remove all of the hardship from your life. They obviously hadn't read Romans 8, 28, 29. <laughs> but this was the situation he was in. And despite his relationship with God, he was facing the opposition of others, and he was greatly disturbed and upset by the abuse he was receiving. In verse number three, he says, my tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Again, we see them mocking him, despising him, so much so that he is disturbed, he is upset, and he's, he's crying day and night over the burden and the struggle and the confusion and the suffering that he's going through. Then what we find in verses 5 and 7, we find some more layers added on to this heartache and the struggle. Verse 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Now his soul being cast down, we might call him depressed. <laughs> his soul was cast down, his heart was wearied, his, his inner man was struggling, and then, and why art thou disquieted within me? Disquieted, we might say that he was upset. We might say that he was anxious. We might say that he was fearful. We might say that he was distraught. And then in verse 7, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. And so he felt overwhelmed. 
He felt like the waves were just crashing over his head. And it's, it's a disorienting feeling. I remember as a teenager, my family and I had an opportunity to uh, take a holiday in Florida. One of my dad's clients uh, had a property down there and he let us use it for a couple of weeks. And so that was a blessing. But there had just recently been a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. And so when we went down to the beach one day to swim, the waves were huge and it was so much fun. I remember standing in the water, the wa water would be up to my waist, the wave would come and I would jump as high as I possibly could and the wave would still go over my head and I would tumble through the water. Now that's cool if it's for fun, but if it's not for fun, it could be terrifying <laughs> to be tumbling through the water and not know which way is up. And that's where the psalmist felt. He felt like the waves were crashing over his head and he couldn't touch the bottom. At times, we too face persecutions and oppositions. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in connection with 1 Peter this morning, but also in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <laughs> there will be opposition for us when we honor and live for the Lord. Jesus said, uh, you know, watch out when all men speak well of you. <laughs> You've got to be watchful. He said, they hated me before they hated you, so don't be too surprised if they hate you for my sake. And so we can understand that there will at times be opposition to our message for Christ, our love for the Lord, our desire to live for truth and righteousness. Sometimes people are going to hate on us for it. And there are haters out there. I wish there wasn't, and, <laughs> and yet there is. And so we must understand that that can be a possibility. If not from people directly, sometimes we face that spiritual opposition. In Ephesians 6 and verse 12, it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And there is certainly a spiritual realm to the opposition that we face. Sometimes we think people are our problems. I'll let you in on a secret. They're not the problem. <laughs> the problem is that there is a devil, that there is demons in the world today, and they do fight in war against the truth. They fight in war against godliness and righteousness. And sometimes when people seem to be the problem, we should see past the people and see that there's a spiritual warfare going on around us. And so we too, at times, are the pursued. We are the ones that are being chased and hounded by the devil and his servants. Also in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we find, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil's like a lion. <laughs> and he takes no prisoners. He is looking to devour. When a lion catches a, its prey, not only does it devour the flesh and the meat, it also even will break open the bones and eat the marrow from the bones. That's, that's our adversary. We do face a spiritual opposition. And I'm not saying that to scare you or to terrify you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And James chapter four and verse seven says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, so we don't need to be afraid, but we do need to be watchful. And we do need to understand that at times we will face an opposition. And it's understandable that at times we will feel that pursuit, that hatred, that persecution, that opposition. Also, we can at times feel overwhelmed by the urgency and the need that we have in life and in ministry to have the grace and help of the Lord. The urgency and the burden of what we see around us. We have been given a commission to reach the world with the gospel. We have given, given a call to walk with the Lord and to be conformed to Christ and to live for the Savior and to, uh, and to reach people. We're called to pray for the lost. We're called to pray for the wayward and the struggling. And we are called to be so active and involved. And sometimes we can sense the, the need and feel overwhelmed by the importance and the urgency of those needs because lives are hanging in the balance because the work of God is so desperately important. And we might feel a little bit like Queen Esther did in Esther 8 and verse 6, where she said, for how can I endure to see the evil that shall come upon my people? Or how shall I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? She understood the urgency of the hour. She understood the desperation of her people. And so also sometimes we might feel a desperation to look at the urgency of the work that God has called us to. And would to God that we would understand that in our lives. The second thing we'll talk about in this psalm is the panting, because that's what we see from this deer, this heart. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, as the deer pants after the water. That's the panting, the urgency. Panting is the expression of desperation. You can be desperate and not express it, but panting, that 
expression, that longing that is expressed of desperation, of need. Panting is not our normal experience in casual situations. <laughs> if you've ever been exhausted, if you've ever been under strain, if you've ever been in desperate need, sometimes you may have been panting. Panting comes from strain. When there's been urgency, there's been exertion. It comes from lack that something's needed in your body. If you're panting, it's probably oxygen. <laughs> you're trying to get some more oxygen in. Uh, it's about weakness, that there's a, a, a lack of strength needed there, a lack of resource needed there. And so there's this need, there's this lack, there's this strain and pressure upon the systems of the body. That's what causes the panting. And so here we see this urgency, this need, this lack of resources. And the problem so often in our lives is is not that we have needs that we cannot meet. And I know that's often what we might call the presenting problem. I have a need and I can't meet it. Aha, that's what we think is the situation, right? We think, ah, there's a need in my life. I need help. I need strength. I need wisdom. I need power for witnessing. I need uh, $12,000 for a trip to Cambodia. I need, uh, I need wisdom. I need direction. I need unction for preaching the word of God. I need I need answers to prayer for the people that I'm praying for that are desperately in need of the rescue from the Lord in their urgent situations. And we can sense that desperate situation and we can recognize the need that we cannot meet. But the problem is not that we have needs that we cannot meet. Often the problem is that we fail to recognize how desperate our situation is at every moment. <laughs> Sometimes we sense our need more keenly than at other times. But that doesn't mean that our need is not constantly as urgent and as desperate. We need the Lord. We need help. Sometimes we recognize our need and sometimes we don't recognize our need. But the need is always there. We are dependent upon the Lord every single day of our lives, every single moment, every single heartbeat, our heartbeat every single breath that we take. We need the Lord. I talked a little bit this morning about the power of our God and how that he holds every molecule in the universe together. Who do you think is holding your life together? It's not you with your bailing wire and duct tape that's holding your life together. It's the grace of God. You and I need the Lord for every moment of our lives. And sometimes we recognize that a little more obviously when, when you know, uh, the paycheck doesn't come in or when the health situation isn't what we'd hope it would be or when we know somebody who's in an urgent need and, and needs prayer and we're trying to plead with God, oh, would you help them? Sometimes we recognize our need more than at other times, but it doesn't mean our need is any less any other day. We are ultimately completely dependent upon God for everything. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1 that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And so this panting, this need, this urgency is sometimes an expression of our desperation, our time of recognizing how urgent the need is. But it's not that our need is any less the rest of the time. There is always a need for prayer. There is always a need for the grace of God. There is always a need for the intervention of our Lord in our lives and in the lives of those that we care about. The, the need is always beyond our ability to meet it. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. We always need his grace. We always are dependent upon him to intervene. We are utterly dependent. Now, there's a famous story in the Old Testament. We won't take the time tonight to turn to it, but to remind you of some of the details, <clears throat> you might remember Jacob. He was the schemer, the trickster, the deceiver, and yet God had a plan for his life. And Jacob was journeying back from having sojourned away from his uh, ancestral home and his family, and as he was on his way back, he knew that his brother was coming to meet him. Now, Jacob and Esau were brothers, and they were very different, and they did not get along. So if you think you had a bad relationship with your siblings, boy, Jacob and Esau did. Jacob had deceived his father and had pretended to be his brother. Now, I always wondered how that worked out. I mean, I know his father was blind, but seriously, somehow he managed to con his own father into believing that he was the older brother Esau, and he tricked his father into giving him the, the blessing that was chosen for the firstborn son. And his brother was so furious that he said, as soon as dad kicks the bucket, I'm going to kill my brother. And he was plotting to murder him. Now, 
Jacob, now years later, is returning back towards his homeland, and he hears that Esau is coming to meet him with hundreds of armed men. (laughs) Now, you can imagine the level of panic that would rise in Jacob's heart when he thinks, oh man, he's going to kill me. (laughs) He said he was going to kill me, and now he's coming with hundreds of armed men. It's done. (laughs) I'm in big, big trouble. And so what he does is he sends his family across the, there's a, a brook there, a little creek. He sends his, his wife, wives and children across to, uh, to the other side. And then through the night, he waits alone by the side of the creek. And what we find is that in the middle of the night, a man shows up. And it, for no apparent reason, starts wrestling with Jacob. <laughs> I always wondered, how did that happen? Hi there, who are you? I don't know, let's wrestle. (laughs) But somehow they ended up wrestling together in the middle of the night and they wrestled and they wrestled and they wrestled and they wrestled until the sun was just starting to peek over the horizon and the day was beginning to break. And this person that Jacob was wrestling with, who in Genesis there is called a man, but in the book of Hosea, chapter 12 and verse 4, he's referred to as an angel. This This man or this angel, as we see him referred to differently, says to Jacob, let me go. I got to get out of here. The day is breaking. It's time for me to leave. And so here, Jacob, in his fear of this attack from his brother, is wrestling with this man, this angel, until morning comes. And then in Genesis 32 and verse 26, Jacob said, uh, so he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. He says, I am not letting go. I need a blessing. I need some help. And I don't know how much Jacob understood in that moment, but he knew that whoever this was, it was somebody that could help, somebody that could give him a blessing. And in his urgency and in his desperation, he said, I'm not letting go. Now, right before this conversation part took place, this angel had touched Jacob's leg in a specific spot, and one of his tendons was injured. And uh, the Bible tells us that after this, Jacob walked with a limp. (laughs) So it was a significant uh, injury to Jacob's tendon in his leg. But still, I'm not letting go unless I get that blessing. I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I need a blessing. You don't understand. I and my family are all going to die in the morning. I need a blessing. This is the urgency that he had in his heart and in his voice. The desperation. He refused to let go without that blessing. He knew he needed something. He didn't know what it was he needed, and he didn't know how he was going to get it, but he knew that this was the only hope he had was to keep holding on and keep holding on. I need the blessing, and I need it now. I'm not letting go. I'm not waiting for you to come back. I'm not looking for promises. I need something right now. And that desperation, that urgency in his heart was so powerful. Interestingly, Jacob named that location after this event. Do you know what he named it? He named it Peniel, which means the face of God. He said, for I have seen the face of God and my life is preserved. And so the text in Genesis calls it a man. Hosea calls it an angel. And Jacob says, I'm pretty sure I just saw the Lord. And so I believe it probably was the Lord Jesus Christ, the messenger of the Lord. God in the flesh looked like a man, but he he had the power of God. And here Jacob was holding on for dear life. Sometimes in our lives we feel that desperation, that strain, and we don't know where to turn to find help, to find satisfaction, to find relief, to find rescue. Sometimes in our desperation we might grasp whatever and whoever is closest and just squeeze and hang on. And that's where Jacob was. He was desperate in his urgency. And we see his soul panting. I'm not letting go. Unless I get that blessing. I need it. I cannot, I cannot go without. And I believe that there's power in our lives when we understand the divine desperation of our lives that we need the Lord. We need help. We need intervention. And when we embrace the fact that we can pursue the Lord and find his intervention in our lives, because Jacob knew he needed help. He was, he was out of options. He had no more games to play, no more tricks to pull, no more lies to tell. He was up against the wall, and he knew it. And in his moment of desperation, 
He got honest with God and said, I just need help. <laughs> I'm stuck. I don't know where else to turn. And sometimes in our lives, when we recognize the urgency of a need, the urgency of a situation, the absolute inability of our own strength to meet that need, sometimes we come to that place of desperation where we throw ourselves upon the Lord and we say, God, I, I got nothing else. <laughs> I am desperate. I am urgent. I am insistent. I need your help. And this brings us to the last point of the message this evening, and that is the priority. Because what we find in our text here is we find the psalmist, like that deer, was pursued. He had opposition, he had haters, he had persecutors, he had trouble, he had turmoil outside his life and inside his soul. It was a storm, and he didn't know if he was going to make it another night. And so we find him panting, <laughs> yearning, earnest, desperate. But what was it that he was desperate for? Was he panting for solutions, panting for rescue? We know that deer was panting for water, right? And so we can say, ah, he was panting for, for, for some sort of help, some sort of rescue. But that's not what the psalmist says. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 again. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? He wasn't looking just for answers. He wasn't looking just for help. He wasn't looking just for relief and satisfaction. He said, I need the Lord. The things that he can do for me are secondary to the opportunity to, to have his presence, to have a relationship with him, to know that he is there and to experience his care over my life. He is the satisfaction we're longing for. I think we've all had those situations of life where we have that desperate urgency in our soul and we're like, I just need some help. I need some answers. I need some certainty. I need some clarity. And what we need is not answers and certainty and clarity and provision. What we need is Jesus. What we need is a closeness with the Lord. That's where the answers come from. That's where the grace comes from. That's where the certainty and hope comes from. It's not in the things that we need that we cannot achieve on our own. It is in the need for the Lord. We were designed for one thing. That's to have a relationship with the Lord. And we talked this morning about how that we cannot have the right relationship with the Lord except we be conformed to the image of Christ. And through salvation, we have that opportunity. But that's what we're designed for, is to have a relationship with the Lord. And He is the, the, the answer to our deepest needs and longings. When we have urgency in our soul, when we have need, when we have uh, desperation, when we have a fervency in our heart to see a need met, we've all got those situations in our heart where we feel like, like there's something missing, like there's something hurting, there's something broken, something struggling. The answer is not in a distraction, in a prescription, in a satisfaction. The answer is in Jesus Christ. He is the one who fills our heart's needs. He is the one who can fulfill and complete our heart and our holes in our lives. He's the one who meets those needs. And so the psalmist here was panting and yearning and begging, oh, please, God, I just want you. I just want you. There's a song that I like. I got a, a music CD at a preaching conference many years ago, and the theme of the conference that year was prayer. And there's a song about prayer where the song says, I'm not asking for anything. It's just your presence I need. And that's where we see the psalmist here. Lord, I don't... Lord, I'm having trouble. Lord, I feel like I'm being chased like a deer through the wilderness. I'm about at, at the end of my wits. I feel like I'm overwhelmed. I don't know which way is up anymore. Lord, I need you. I need you. And what we find is that he is the answer we're looking for. It's not that we need an answer from the Lord. It's that we need the Lord. He is the source of all that we need. The amazing thing about Jacob, here he was pleading with the Lord, God, give me a blessing. I need the blessing. But remember that he was the one who had lied and tricked and deceived to get a blessing from his earthly father. And here he is finding the one he really needed a blessing from. Yes, 
the blessing of his father was great, and fathers giving blessings to their children is a blessing. That's wonderful. But it's the Lord we need to connect with. It's the Lord that we need to hear from. It's the Lord that we need to get a grip on and not let go. He's the one that we need to find. He's the one we need to walk with and know. Another example is Moses. Moses was the leader of the people of God in the Old Testament. He had brought them out of the land of Egypt. He had brought them through the Red Sea by the miracle of God. And on their journey through the wilderness towards the promised land, they came to a point of crisis. You can find that point of crisis if you want to read more about it later in Exodus chapter 33. But in that situation, Moses was talking to the Lord about the journey forward about going forward to the promised land and what was going to happen next and where they were going to go. And in Exodus 33 and verse number 15, Moses said to the Lord, and he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. He said, I don't want to go anywhere if you're not coming. And how many times have I prayed that in prayer? Lord, I don't want to go anywhere unless you're coming with me. I can't handle this. I can't do this. I can't face this. I can't overcome this. I don't have the need to, the ability to supply the need. Lord, if you're not going, I'm not going. I need you. That was the heart of Moses. Lord, I need you. He is the one that we need. He is the one we look to. He is the one that we yearn for. And in our moments of desperation, rather than grasping and clawing at solutions and at opportunities and at the things that we can try and wrestle into our control, just gripping harder on the problem is not going to solve it. But what we need to do so often is to get our, our eyes focused on the Lord and find the walk with him and find our closeness with him because he is the one who can give strength. He is the one who can give certainty and clarity. He is the one whose presence gives peace even in the midst of the storm. Moses recognized this. Hezekiah recognized this. In the life of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, they faced an invasion by an an enemy force. And as this enemy invaded the land and was marching towards their city, ready to destroy them, God said, go fight them. And Hezekiah knew that without the Lord's help, they could do nothing about it. They were in deep trouble. And as the enemy advanced and as the danger grew, Hezekiah prayed. He was a wise man. (laughs) Pray, pray. And in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12, this is what he said, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. Again, we've got oppression. We've got pursuit. They're coming against us. And we've got the uncertainty, the panting. Lord, we don't even know what to do. How are we going to face this mighty army? Then he says, but our eyes are upon thee. That's the answer. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look and live. Find the grace and the comfort and the strength that comes from seeing the Savior's face and being refreshed, being restored, being encouraged, being directed and comforted. Hezekiah knew where the answer would be found. It was in the Lord. He wasn't in better military strategies. He wasn't back in the castle digging out military textbooks to figure out what was the great strategy was going to achieve victory for them that day. No, he was on his knees saying, Lord, I, I don't even know what to do. All I could do is look to you. This is the answer. This is the place of hope is, Lord, I can't solve this situation. I can't meet this need. I can't fix that problem. I can't answer that prayer. I can't heal that person. I can't mend that relationship. I can't do all of these things. Lord, I don't know what to do. All I need is you. The answer is always Jesus. Now, I wish in some sense that we knew what the outcome was for the psalmist. We saw his pursuit, his panting, but we saw his priority. And I don't know how his situation turned out. I wish we knew who it was so I could tell you the end of his story. But what I can tell you is this. Esther, remember, she saw the urgency of the need of the people of her day. She looked to the Lord and God took care of her. How about Jacob? He wrestled with God and God said, I'm going to help you. You have power with man and with God and have prevailed. He said, I'm not going to call you anymore Jacob. Jacob means the deceiver, the trickster. 
a sneak. <laughs> he said, I'm going to call your name Israel, a prince with God. And you know what happened when his brother showed up? All of his hate had vanished. <laughs> his brother showed up with hugs and kisses and a welcome and embraced him, contrary to all expectation. Moses, God did go with them, and God did bring them through the wilderness and into the promised land. And Hezekiah, you know what happened? They started getting close to the field of battle, and they didn't even take their weapons with them. They just sang praise to the Lord. They said, God promises a victory. <laughs> Let's go and see the victory. And when they got there, all their enemies had already been defeated. They didn't even need to fight the battle. God is able to care for us. But what we need to focus on is less the need and the crisis and the problems and focus more on the, the Lord who is the answer, who is the hope, who is the purpose of our being. It's good for us, I believe, to have an urgency, a divine desperation to recognize how dependent we are on God and how big the needs of life are. I fear that too often in modern Christianity in Canada today that a lot of what people call Christianity is very casual, very convenient, very complacent. I believe that God wants us to have a greater fervency, a greater urgency, a greater passion to walk with the Lord, to live separate from sin, to put aside the cares and deceitfulness of this world, and to pour ourselves wholeheartedly into a pursuit of a walk with God that is real, that is rich, that is powerful, that is transformative, that is a light. Like Jesus said, you are the light of the world, like a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. That urgency, that desperation, oh God, would you use me? Oh God, would you work in my life? Oh God, would you give me deliverance from these challenges and temptations that are pulling me away from you? Oh God, would you break me of these sinful tendencies that have too long controlled my life? Oh God, would you reach that lost person I'm praying for? Oh God, would you salvage the life of that prodigal? Oh God, would you work a work in our day that people would see it and lift the name of Jesus high? A desperation to see God do something great. May we never become complacent in our Christianity where we think that the ho-hum is good enough, but where we are believing God for miracles, when we are believing that God is still real, that God still works, that God still moves, that God still saves, that God still changes lives, that God still works miracles and answers prayers. You know what? We can, say, we can sit, sit in church on a Sunday morning and say, Lord, we need $12,000, and the next day it shows up. You know, God can answer prayers. God is still at work and an urgency and a desperation to see the hand of God move because if all we have is what we can do, we're in big trouble. And the people we love and pray for are in big trouble if all we have is what you and I can achieve. There are lives all around us in desperate, urgent need of an intervention from the Lord. And I believe we need a fervency, we need a passion, we need prayers that have tears in them, we, we need a yearning and a panting after God to see the Lord do a work in these days. Are we in the last days? Amen. Jesus could come at any moment. But I don't want to leave this life if Christ should come. I don't want to leave from my lazy boy. I want to leave on the front lines of the battlefield, believing God for things, believing God for victory, believing God for miracles. Vance Havner was a famous preacher of the last century. He said, the tragedy of our time is that our situation is desperate, but we who are saints are not desperate. I believe that as we seek after God, we cannot afford complacent Christians in these last days. We cannot afford ho-hum Christianity in these last days. We need Christians today who will charge the gates of hell on their knees, who will plead with God in prayer and labor with all of their hearts, and believe God for great things with a desperation, an earnestness, a fervency. If Jesus Christ came tonight and all of God's people went up in the rapture this evening, hallelujah, amen. But there would be a lot of work that would be left undone because we wouldn't be here to do it. And may we recognize the urgency of these times. And I know that the rapture of Jesus has always been imminent since the time of the scriptures being written 2,000 years ago but we are closer now than we have ever been. And I don't know, but Jesus might come tonight. I always, I always love it when pastor says, I don't know why he didn't come last week. 
He sure could have. But in the days that we have, in the lives we've been given, may we never be complacent. May we never be idle. May we never be apathetic and unbelieving. But may we recognize the urgency of our hour. And trust me, it's always been urgent. (laughs) But in this hour, may we recognize the urgency for God guided, spirit-filled, fervent Christians who will dedicate their lives lock, stock, and barrel to the Lord and say, I just want you to lead my life. I want you to fill me. I want you to control me. I want you to guide every step that I take, every word that I say, every thought that I think. God, I'm selling out to you tonight. I just want you to have your way in my life. That desperation for God can be used of the Lord for him to reveal himself to us and to reveal himself through us to a world that is desperately hungry for answers and hope. Man, the world's dark without Jesus, isn't it? We are the light that God has put into this world to shine his glory, to make a difference. May we recognize the urgency of the hour, the desperate need for each of our lives as well as for those around us, that our lives would make a difference, that our lives would count for something for Christ that our walk with him would be so real, so fervent, so empowered by God that we would leave this world by rapture or, or by death, having shaken our communities, our homes, our neighborhoods, our church, our country, and our world with the power of Christ through dedicated, desperate people. You know, when times get desperate, you'll do anything anything. You've got a health crisis. You're like, doctor, tell me what I got to do. I don't care what it is. I'll do it. (laughs) Right? When Naaman had leprosy in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, he went to the prophet and the prophet said, go wash in the river. And he was like, what? I'm not doing that. That's stupid. I got lots of rivers back home. And his servant said to him, um, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, it's worth a shot. (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess it's worth a try. Is it not (laughs) worth anything that we could give (laughs) to have the presence of God in our lives? What sacrifice is too great to have the walk with God that he intends for us to have where the omnipotent power of the creator of all things is flowing through our lives and making a difference in this world? What could we say is too great of a sacrifice to have the blessing and power of God upon us? The richness and abundance of his grace and his strength is available. But too often we get so distracted and apathetic and complacent that we miss the miracles that God has for us. May we never become complacent, but may that divine desperation and urgency and fervency in our spirit say, God, I don't care what happens today, but I need you. (laughs) I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to cost. I don't know what I'm going to go through, but if I have you, that's all I need. May our hunger and yearning and zeal for the Lord be real tonight. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Oh, before we do, I almost forgot. I have another poem for you. (laughs) Please pardon the form of the poem. It just came out this way. The poem is called Satisfaction in Desperation. As I hang on the brink of disaster, I am praying for help to come faster. I feel that my grip is starting to slip and I scream to be heard by the master. I may think that I need intervention as I hang in this risky suspension. Despite how I yelp and call out for help, I have missed the Lord's clear, wise intention. So instead of my ranting and raving, There's something I need more than saving. I find that the need I really must feed is that God is the food for my craving. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. So we bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord tonight. Maybe God spoke to you about a need for a greater desperation in your walk with the Lord. Maybe things have become cold. Maybe things have become backslidden. Maybe things have become complacent where the ho-hum is just good enough. Maybe faith needs to be rekindled in your heart tonight to believe that God still can. God still can, and God will. And maybe that yearning for the Lord has been welling up in your heart. Maybe you've started to feel that panting of your soul after the Lord. Maybe you're one of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. God can fill. Maybe God spoke to you tonight, and you need to make a rededication of your life to the Lord and say, Lord God, maybe things have gotten a little too cold. Maybe things have got a little too distracted. Maybe things have gotten a little too corrupted with my behavior. And Lord, I'm ready to be all in. Maybe that's the first time you'll say that to the Lord. Tonight, I'm all in, Lord. 
Or maybe it's a renewal of that dedication tonight to say, Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm coming right back. Lord, whatever it is, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, I, I need you. There's a difference between wanting the Lord and recognizing we need the Lord. If God spoke to your heart tonight and you'd like me to pray for you, if you lift your hand, I promise I'll pray for you. Amen, amen. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. Nothing else will do. We must have him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that in our desperation and our urgency and our need for you tonight, that you are abundantly ready to meet us where we are. You have promised in your word, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. And Lord, as we reach out to you tonight, recognizing our desperate need, our lack, our frailty, our inability, Lord, I pray you'd help us to dedicate ourselves anew and afresh to you tonight, that nothing would pull aside our focus, nothing would distract us, nothing would, would defeat our faith, our fervency, our yearning for you. Lord, may our hunger for you tonight reach a fervency where we will take no distraction, we will take no substitutes, but we must have a closer walk with you. May you build in us a fervency, a desperation, an urgency tonight, recognizing that as we seek after you, we will find you. We will see your hand upon us. And with whatever proportion we surrender and dedicate ourselves tonight, that you are ready to meet us in like proportion. Lord, thank you for those who raised a hand tonight, indicating a desire to be closer to you, to have that fervency, that urgency in their heart. Lord, I pray that as each of us do surrender to you tonight, that you would give evidence even tonight of your meeting us there. That you would give a confirmation by your spirit in our hearts tonight that your promises are real, they are sure, they're steadfast. And that you are there as soon as we turn to you. Lord, I pray that these would not be moments of a passing, fleeting emotion, but Lord, that lasting decisions would be made tonight. May we dedicate ourselves afresh upon the altar of the Savior. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.